So I'm Andy Stanford Clark, as you mentioned, I'm the CTO of IBM UK and Ireland. Um, what you didn't mention, I was one of IBM's distinguished engineers, but um, you're just being I, I can be modest about that. Um, and uh, slightly more than 40 patents. So I did have 42 patents, which I thought was just fantastic from a sort of Douglas Adams point of view. Um, but I accidentally got one more last year. Damn it. So uh, uh, 43. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, so in my, uh, my day job, I talk to cl our clients about technologies as they're emerging, how they fit in with the, uh, the, the current technologies, what the, the future technologies look like. Um, and blockchain is one of the things I talk about quite a lot because uh, it is just a ledger, as, as you say. And, um, but people are finding interesting things to do with it. But I'm not talking about those technologies today. Um, I'm going to talk about um, how we can harness the power of developers and the enthusiasm to make change for good. Um, every day we hear about um, some new disaster that's happened. I don't want to spread doom and gloom, but there's always, always something going on. And uh, quite often these things, my background's an internet of things. And I always think, ah, if only they'd put a sensor on that volcano, or if only they'd done some, some monitoring of that thing. I'm sure they could have decreased the, the loss of life or had more warning of it so they could have evacuated before the flood happened. And, uh, that's often been on my mind. And um, we had an, have an initiative, we're in, involved in an initiative called Call for Code. Has anybody heard of Call for Code? Two. That's, that's pretty disappointing. Uh, we actually had um, more than 100,000 people involved in it all around the world in 156 different countries. Um, it's been a, a multinational thing with lots of companies involved. The hashtag Tech for Good uh, came up a lot, a lot of times. And the idea was that people would harness the uh, the problem solving ability, the innovation, the creative the spirit of developers to come up with some code that would help uh, some, some, some technology that would help in a natural disaster, either in the, the preamble to it, you know, detecting it while it was actually happening or recovering from it afterwards. That's really the three areas they could have picked. And uh, in the, the first go around last year, uh, there was the winner was Project Owl. And I'll just talk a little bit about that. So they came up with this really cool and I say that because I'm into Internet of Things, uh, project which, so the first thing that tends to go down in a natural disaster is the mobile phone network. And of course, now we always rely on our mobile phones, even if it's just for making phone calls uh, and not for um, using the apps. But often there's the apps which we would, like Google Maps, for example, which we'd say were pretty much essential to life. And uh, m mainly because we've sort of grown up having those things. I know when I was a school child, we didn't have to phone my mum from a call box to say I was on my way home. I didn't just text her and say things like that. But um, you know, obviously, we just got used to that. And if our children don't text us every two minutes, we panic because they might be lost or something like that. So you know, the world has definitely changed, but we do come to rely on those things. So they created this little IoT device, which sets up it's a mesh network which provides a Wi-Fi network. So your phones see it as a Wi-Fi network. It's kind of a public Wi-Fi network. They're all connected together. You just drop these things across an area, and that one of them connects to the, the real world, the internet, you know, the actual internet, and thereby providing an ad hoc network for people to use. And as the winners of this, they, they actually took it um, on the road to test. And uh, fingers crossed for the AV working this time. The winner of the 2018 <laughs> Call for Code is Project Owl. <laughs> Winning Call for Code was such an empowering experience, not just for myself, but my team. The night we had won, we were all sitting in a room together and we said, we're gonna to go to Puerto Rico. In the worst disasters, like Hurricane Maria, these are typically the events where connectivity infrastructure is most likely to be offline. How do you leverage a sophisticated software system when you have no electricity or internet to do it? We created these little IoT devices called ducks. We turn on these ducks, and then you can open your phone, connect to the Wi-Fi network that they create, and start talking to others on the network. What Owl is trying to do with this quickly deployed network is to establish not 100% connectivity, but just bring it from zero to 1%, which is a huge difference to just get who needs what in a particular community. A solution like Owl definitely could come in handy in an emergency like the one we had. There are other hardware and software solutions, but this combination of both, it's what makes it different and powerful. What it takes to actually get Project Owl out there is we need some type of support from people who can show us a little bit of a path forward. And for us, that partner is IBM. 
through our Code and Response program. And we're helping Project OWL implement their solution as part of the award for having won the Call for Code competition. We see Code and Response as taking these ideas and helping to make them real. In a place like Puerto Rico, with everything that had happened after Hurricane Maria, it makes it a very ripe opportunity for new technologies to make a large scale impact. Open source is so important to this. Making people aware as it's actively developed, these are the bugs, these are the areas where it excels, this is where we need help to make it better. OWL and IBM can collaborate as amazing partners and have this fantastic relationship, but at the end of the day, the team we've built has to be able to support this mission and this endeavor and continue to achieve that scaled impact. The owl's got to fly. Love that, the owl's got to fly. Although the device itself was called a duck, so I didn't quite get the link between owls and ducks there. But uh, um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so Call for Code carries on. 2019, we've got all these uh, partners involved in it. Um, the Red Cross, uh, United Nations Human Rights, the, uh, the Linux Foundation was very quick to come on board as one of the, uh, the, the partners in this project. And the, the, the big thing about this is that all of that code, all the things these guys have created, and women, of course, women and men have created, it is all open source. So everything, one of the criteria is it gets checked into GitHub at the end of the hacking sessions, and all the code is available for anybody to use. So you haven't got to pay a license fee for it. If you find it doesn't do quite what you want of it, you can fork it and change it the way you want it to do. And that's the, the, the big mission here. And the, the, the code and response part, which um, was mentioned a couple of times in that video, is IBM's initiative to actually deploy some of that code into real world situations. And it's the, the three phases of preparing for a disaster, responding to it as it's happening, and then recovering from it. So whichever phase of that if people are, different organizations, NGOs are involved in, they can deploy these technologies to do that. And there's a big chunk of change, a uh, cash prize for it. And, but the main thing is a lot of support from mentors and potential investors to try and make this into a, a going concern, because you know, this is really important. And the people who are doing this are so enthusiastic about it. They're just thinking, oh, because we, we like going to hackathons. I've done lots of Internet of Things hackathons where um, it, you come up with a cool gadget that does something which could be a product one day, but to do something which is actually changing lives for people, saving lives, that's a really powerful thing to do, and it, the motivation is just unbelievable. So uh, part of code, Call for Code 19 was just last week, literally just last week, in Geneva. Uh, there were four key challenges, and we've kind of made this a bit more structured. So we've got to building back better, so in other words, the, the recovery phase of it, We've got improving flood and drought prevention and response particularly, uh, humanitarian protection in times of disaster, and accountability and centrality of protection for affected populations. So under those four challenges, people have picked their themes. And the idea is actually to build out some infrastructure, which for code, call for code 2021, the ongoing thing, there'll be some, some groundwork done to establish infrastructure which people can build on. So it's really, rather than coming up with random projects and implementing them, we want to make this a bit more structured, in fact, a lot more structured. So the, the one in Geneva had uh, 35 developers from 10 countries, uh, sorry, 10 companies, uh, and two days to, to start laying out that foundation. And again, we've got all these partners who are all part of this, this system, um, so this ecosystem. And if you want to find out more, ibm.biz slash starters is a good place to, uh, to find out more about it. Now I'm going to talk about the way we tell the world about open source technologies. Um, we've got an area called IBM Developer, which if you go to ibm.com slash developer, you can go and find all these uh, completely open source projects, all checked into GitHub, of more than 100 code patterns. So they're applications that you might want to write. For example, you might want to write uh, an iOS app that build, uses built-in and custom classifiers. I know you're just thinking, ah, oh, if only you had one of those, where you can go to IBM developers, check out the code, and actually download it, compile it, and run it. Um, within IBM, we've got 60,000 IBMers who use open source technology in various ways, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, but this is you know, the whole sort of open by design thing is really much in our DNA. And uh, we have developer advocates. These are people who go out and talk to developers, uh, from universities through startups to small companies to big corporations and do meetups, uh, some in London, some in Bristol, some in Edinburgh, um, we're spreading, um, not the 500 cities that, um, that um, guy from Google, sorry, I've forgotten his name, mentioned, thank you, um, mentioned, but um, 
a small number of cities. Uh, but, but the point is they're telling you about how to use your Kubernetes and your Istio and your um, um, TensorFlow and how to integrate those into applications, actually do useful things with them. IBM has been involved in lots of open source projects. Way back, we donated technology to Linux. Uh, we donated, actually, we, we had this lovely development IDE called, well, it was, then it was called um, the IBM Developer IDE, but we donated it to a, um, an open foundation called Eclipse, eclipse.org, um, and that's kind of become a huge movement for open source software. Uh, we've contributed to things like Kubernetes and Docker. And so any technologies that we, we use, we think are important, and that our clients use, we get involved in the uh, actually contributing to that community, contributing code, having our developers working on it, so that it becomes sort of self-sustaining and we can kind of nudge it in a direction that we've, we're told by our clients that we think is important and help make these things, make, make the community vibrant. Uh, things like Spark for analytics and it, you name it, it's probably pretty much we're involved in it. And if you're in, interested in getting involved in open source, there's sort of three ways to participate, and it's quite the third one's quite interesting. So the first one is you can kind of be a consumer of it. So you can say, right, I'm going to use open source technology in my, in my company, in the things I do, um, in the code I write, put it, build it into my product. Um, and you can be involved in that. Um, you can provide air cover for your customers. If your customers are using open source code, you can uh, support them in doing that. Uh, and also be involved in the governance of open source projects. So even if another company is majoring on the uh, development of a particular um, open source project, you, the, the governance of it to make sure it goes, off, it goes in the direction that the community wants rather than one particular company wants or a in particular individual wants is very important. Another way is to simply be the author of a piece of software uh, and have developers in your company doing that and to be contributing that code into open source, developing it, effectively running the community and lots of people do that and we in fact do that in a number of cases as well. Um, but the other one is um, find the open source projects that are most important to your organization and clients often say to me yeah well we're using this bit of software but not, it's not quite the same as having a piece of like proprietary code because what if it breaks at two o'clock in the morning who do I phone? Uh, they say, use the phrase, one throat to choke, which I think is a horrible thing to say. <laughs> but, um, you know, one throat to choke kind of thing. That's why well, you have to raise an issue on GitHub. But the point is, they, you don't know what's going to happen there. Now, you, you can, of course, pay for software support uh, from OSS, both um, the thing for Red Hat model, for example, making a huge business out of uh, support for open source code. Uh, but if you are part of the community of the software products that you use the most and you rely on, and people will know you. You've probably fixed a few bugs. You know, you, you've given something to that community. So when you raise that bug at 2 o'clock in the morning, they go, ah, Andy's just raised a bug. Yep, let's get onto that quick. And so because you'll know, you, you get back in return for the gift. So that whole sort of give to get thing is really, really important. So uh, three ways to get involved. Um, if you want to start getting more involved in open source in your organization, and it has to be done in a sort of governed sort of way. I mean, undoubtedly in your organization, you, there's open source stuff going on. Your developers will be using open source tools day in, day out, even if you don't know they are. Um, and in your DevOps environment, there'll be open source tools, Kubernetes and all that kind of stuff running, Docker containers. Um, but we have quite a, a sort of structured approach to that in IBM and we, we call it open by design. And it's worth going through the six elements of that. So one is a training and certification program. So all the people, I mentioned the 60,000 people in IBM who are uh, involved in open source. Um, they've been through the open source training and they have um, a certification to say that they're allowed to uh, touch open source, source code. That sort of helps fix up the IP issues which can be for software development organizations dealing with open source. It's recognition and coaching. So we've got mentors of people who've been doing open source for a few years and recognition people get rewarded for participation in open source projects, both as their day job and their sort of evenings and weekends uh, hobby activities. Tools and automation is really important. So the whole sort of DevOps tool chain through automation of testing and getting into production, that stuff can't be done manually anymore. It has to be done automatically. Uh, so building those tool chains, getting it all automated is absolutely key to making this stuff successful because it's such complicated, there's so many moving parts these days. Um, we've got a central open source center of competence uh, where you can turn to if you've got any questions or they sort of act as a, as a hub, sort of switching questions, a switching hub uh, to get you to the right expert who knows about the particular technology that you're asking about. It's all done through you know, Slack channels and 
um, will be the, the, the trendy modern tools. Um, the consumption of, uh, of open source um, is really wrapped around the, the training and certification part of it. So we, obviously you do have to be careful about some of the IP, especially if you're building products that have open source code in them. You have to be really careful about making sure you don't accidentally uh, accidentally open source what you thought was hoping was going to be a proprietary product and stuff like that. Um, and the other part is co contributing is made easy. So it's, it's okay for anybody to, to um, so for example, I do a lot of stuff with Internet of Things, check out an Arduino library, find a little bug in it, fix that bug, contribute it back. You know, I don't have to ask my manager if it's okay to do that because I've done the open source certification. Um, so it, it, contributing is made easy. So those are the kind of six steps to becoming open by design. And if you're looking to do that in your organization, either take advice from that or look at uh, IBM dot com slash open uh, which things on the next slide yes uh, sorry developer dot ibm dot open which is really where we talk about us sort of stewarding the future for for, uh, for open source software which we think is really really important now I've got three minutes left <laughs> no one's mentioned quantum computing yet I was really hoping somebody would um, I bet you're all hoping I was going to. But so there was a tweet flying around yesterday which got retweeted a few too many times where one of my colleagues said I'd be talking about quantum computing today. So um, just so he's not disappointed, if he's out there, um, I'm just gonna spend the last couple of minutes talking about quantum computing, I hope that's okay. So um, this is what ENIAC looked like 70 years ago, big room full of computers with electronics boards and wires and stuff. And this is what our quantum computer looked like uh, two years ago in 2016. So it was a big rack, Dexian racking, with lots of wires and signal pulse generators and power supplies and all kinds of stuff like that. So we're in the sort of same sort of era now with quantum computing as ENIAC was 70 years ago. So you know, don't get your hopes up too quickly that this stuff's gonna be moving into your data center anytime soon. But um, there's some really cool technology here, and I mean that absolutely literally, because um, this, this is a cryostat, and uh, inside this, uh, through a very clever set of adiabatic pumps uh, is a beautiful thing called the chandelier. Ooh. Uh, now, this, this isn't just made to look pretty, although it does. Uh, it's, it actually chills you from, it's, the top is at 40 Kelvin, okay, so that's minus 230 something degrees C, so it's pretty cold. Um, it gets colder as you go down. The actual quantum computing chips are inside this little bean can at the bottom. And by the time you get down to here, it's at 15 millikelvin. Okay, so it's 15 thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. So minus two, seven, three point something degrees C. One of the coldest places in the universe. Don't put your tongue on it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it won't taste nice. Um, and the, all these wires going up and down are the microwave waveguides, which uh, send the signals in to nudge the, 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 the quantum chips. And this is what actually happens. So with quantum computing, and I'm not going to do a lecture on quantum computing now because I've only got 43 seconds left, but essentially it's all about superposition. So you've heard of Schrodinger's cat, which is neither alive nor dead or both until you look inside the box to find out. Well, in quantum physics, you take a, a qubit, which is the quantum, equivalent, quantum computing version of a bit. Bits can be zero or one, we know all that. Qubits can be zero or one or both or all points in between at the same time, we don't really know until you look at it, then it forces it to back into the classical state, it becomes zero or one. By n taking these qubits and nudging them with these little microwave signals of so clockwise or anti-clockwise, you can change the orientation of the, of the qubit, and I'm getting way too technical here already, uh, <laughs> such that when you look at it, it makes it zero or one. And then that kind of gives you an approximation to the answer. You then run it a whole load of times and you get like a sort of bit like a mass spectrometer thing where you get peaks and like smaller peaks and bigger peaks. And the one with the biggest peak is most likely to be your answer. That's all I'm gonna tell you about quantum computing today. Um, <laughs> suffice to say, ooh, this is the IBM Q system one. So that big lab full of stuff has now been condensed into a nine foot cube designed by some rather, rather clever um, Italian um, designers. Uh, the point of doing this was kind of like a, a concept car. The idea is to show that this is now commercializable. So rather than having to buy a lab full of stuff in order to buy an IBM quantum computer, you could in fact get, if we turn this into a product, and we haven't, it's just one, we've just made one so far, uh, you could buy this nine foot cube box with everything in it. The cryostat is there, it's all silver and shiny instead of being white. All the, all the adiabatic pumps and the microwave generators are all in that big box at the back. And it, all you need is plug it into power, plug it into ethernet, and you're off. 
Uh, so uh, this is probably the future of quantum computing, and I'll be here in the break if you want to talk more about it. Thanks very much.